Excellent. So welcome everyone to this um, new and third uh, Privacy Rules webinar uh, in the context of a three-day uh, series of uh, webinars related to general very hot topics um, concerning data privacy in this uh, particular moment. Uh, my name is Andrea kmilinski bigazzi and I have the pleasure of coordinating uh, Privacy Rules, which is an international alliance of legal, cybersecurity, and most recently also crisis communication experts. Uh, our alliance uh, was launched in 2018, evidently not by coincidence in correspondence with the entry into force of the GDPR. Um, our experts uh, realize that it's important to provide uh, service and information on the basis of um, own expertise, but in an interconnected global way. And so this is what Privacy Rules does. Uh, one of our missions is actually to disseminate independent information on privacy, and uh, we, we like to do so unsponsored and uh, in cooperation with data protection authorities, as are present here, and also representatives from the industry, commerce, uh, trade federations and associations present here today as well. It's not up to me to make the introductions of who they are. This is the responsibility of uh, um, Stella, our moderator, who is also the chair of the Privacy Rules Latin American Committee. Um, and I will leave it definitely to her, the introduction about everyone. Um, just the two comments on, or two notes from my side, sorry. The first, I invite everyone in the public to use the Q&A function of Zoom to submit questions for our panelists in any moment you want. Um, and we will coordinate together with Stella the submissions of the questions. Um, and the other one, reassurance that this webinar is recorded and will be published in the future on private service platforms. We will inform everyone through our social media so that actually you will not miss any um, of the um, uh, pieces of information, precious pieces of information, information from our panelists. Um, I pass immediately the floor to Stella. I will be here again with you all. In the conclusion, Stella Vanegas Morales from Colombia, thank you very much for moderating and the pleasure is to you for the introduction of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I am really happy uh, to be here and uh, it is uh, really honored to be here uh, to have this extraordinary group of uh, panelists and to have the opportunity to uh, speak about privacy that is the field in which I uh, feel more passion to work. Uh, I am the founding partner of Panecas Morales Consultores, that is a law firm that is based in Colombia, in Bogota, Colombia, and I am also a member of Privacy Roots. Today, uh, we are going to have the opportunity to speak about, uh, uh, speak on privacy and cybersecurity as the mass, as a mass too in, in international transfers. And I would like to start by saying that this is an, an extraordinary opportunity to take profit uh, from the spaces that privacy rules has um, generated to create a global conversation on privacy and cybersecurity. I think it is undeniable that in the current times, um, companies and economies are increasingly international. And uh, it makes that we, every time, are seeing personal data flowing among different countries, uh, now more than ever. And besides, I think it's really important to, not, to highlight that most of the countries worldwide uh, have implemented a uh, regulation on privacy and on cybersecurity matters. And some of them are, the, the last, I think, because we already have a, a really big uh, number of countries that they already have, others are starting to implement this regulation. So that's make this point to speak about international transfers with personal data an essential uh, point to uh, international commerce. Uh, so see, if you, if all of us take into account, which I have already said, I think that uh, we can uh, deny that it is a must for any company in the world right now to know how to handle with personal data, how to protect it, how to have uh, or to take appropriate safeguards in order to avoid any kind of breach of this data. 
And that's why we are today with this great group of speakers in order to uh, have more clarity to how to do that, how to continue uh, making the steps in order to get the best level of compliance in uh, privacy uh, that prevents for any kind of breach when an importer or an exporter are sending information from one country to another country. Uh, our panelists today are uh, four people that all of them are really involved in privacy matters. The first speaker is Kim Walker. He is a partner in the commercial technology and IP group at Shakespeare Martina, London. Uh, our second speaker is going to be Linda Lefler also. She's a jurist at the Swedish Trade Federation at an advisor of data and privacy at Eurocommerce. The third speaker is Alexander White. He is the privacy commissioner for Bermuda. And our last speaker, but not less important, is Alejandro Londoño. He is an advisor to the Colombian personal data protection delegate. So to start to talk about this topic on privacy and cybersecurity on data transfers, I would like to start with Kim. So good morning, Kim from Colombia. I'm so happy to be with you in this panel. Uh, Kim, I think you, you was one of the first uh, persons that I met in privacy rules. And I remember when we uh, had this first meeting in Toronto two or three years ago, and Kim is a lawyer, and as I said, he's a partner of this uh, important law firm in London. And I would like to ask you, or um, the first question that I have in mind is, I know that there are many people who still are a little bit confused about the changes that came from Brexit. And the first question is, that probably most people have, is does the GDPR still apply? Thank you, Stella. Yes, that's a, a very good question. And it's true that many people are confused about it. Um, but the, the answer is that we do have uh, the GDPR in the UK, but it's not the EU GDPR that we had until the 1st of January, um, because EU law since Brexit no longer applies in the UK. But what the UK did on the 1st of January was to adopt the whole of the European GDPR into UK law. So we now have a piece of legislation which we refer to as the UK GDPR, by contrast to the EU GDPR. And that applies to the data or the protection of personal data of data subjects in the UK. So um, in reality, the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR are at the moment identical, but because we're no longer in the EU, the UK is free to change the UK GDPR and so that it diverges from the EU version and indeed the UK government has indicated that that's exactly what it intends to do um, where it feels for example that the GDPR is a blocker to innovation or um, unnecessarily bureaucratic or and this is relevant to today's subject um, a barrier to international trade and that's <clears throat> That's really what I'm going to talk about today, you know, how um, the UK is already diverging from the EU GDPR in relation to international um, restricted transfers. So transfers from the UK to a country which hasn't got data protection laws, which the UK or the EU regard as adequate. And so where sa additional safeguards are required. Um, so you're all familiar, I would think, with the with the EU standard contractual clauses, which um, the EU updated and adopted in June this year. Um, what the UK has done is we've, or the UK government has published its own UK SCCs, standard contractual clauses, um, which we're going to call apparently International Data Transfer Agreements, or IDTAs. And these have been out for con consultation, but aren't in force yet, and we're expecting that they'll come into force in um, the early part of next year, so pretty soon. Um, but the, so, so 
businesses which are transferring UK data overseas or indeed overseas businesses which uh, are importing UK personal data have a bit of a problem at the moment in that uh, we're, we're, in, we're, in a, we're in a sort of interim period. So what do they do in the meantime? Well, the UK's regulator has said that in the meantime, businesses should be signing the old EU standard contractual clauses. In other words, the ones that can no longer be used in, in the EU the, the, because they've been replaced by the, the new EU SCCs. So the problem is that businesses transferring UK data could end up signing, you know, now having to sign the old EU SCCs, which, the, as I say, the UK regards as suitable and carrying out a transfer impact assessment, knowing that just in just a, a matter of months, these are going to have to be replaced when the new IDTAs come into force for the UK. And obviously that's not very satisfactory. Um, there, there's another possibility um, because as well as publishing new IDTAs, the UK government is also proposing a UK addendum to the new EU SCCs. And these, this addendum will allow um, the EU SCCs not just to apply to transfers of the data of people in the EU, but also the data of UK people. So it's a, it's a four page document, this addendum, and it's a very simple way effectively for people who use the EU S standard contractual clauses to extend them to cover uh, UK data as well. So I mean, this raises the question, why would anyone sign and, and why will anyone, or would anyone want to sign the new international data transfer agreement um, if they could use the UK addendum and get you know, the best of both worlds, UK and EU coverage? Um, you know, why would they double their paperwork, which is already cumbers cumbersome enough? Why would they double the hassle? The, the, two annexes to complete, two transfer impact assessments to do, um, different ways that sub-processing is dealt with in the, two, in the two documents. So in my opinion, it won't be worth, worth it, even though the new IT, IDTA does have some advantages. It's, it's written in much simpler and plainer English than the rather legalistic EU SCC. So it's much easier for businesses to understand. Um, but I think the only reason, or the only reason people will sign the new IDTAs when they come into force is if they have to, if the UK government says, if there's no EU data involved, or if there's no EU nexus, and it's only, we're only talking about UK data, then you can't use the UK addendum and the EU um, uh, SCCs, but we'll have to wait and see what the government says about that when, when the uh, addendum and IDTA are finally adopted. Um, I, I have so, just one question, Kim, that I would like to yeah. ask you in this moment. So uh, when this IDTA came into force, uh, companies are going to face the duty to comply with both regulations, with the probably with this one and with the standard contractual clauses in order to facilitate the transactions and the relation you know, with other companies. Uh, what do you think, how is going to be this transition? Uh, what do you recommend in this moment? Because we are going to, to face these two stages. The first one, not without uh, having this IDT came into, well, enforced uh, right now. And then we are going to have both regulation and standard contractual clauses from uh, the regime of the European Union and also this one. How can you see these both uh, moments of time uh, in the application of this? regulations? Well, uh, I think you raise a very, a very good point. It's going to be very difficult, very impractical for businesses to try to comply with an IDTA for one segment of their data and, a, and the different obligations of the, e, you know, the EU SECs for, for other data, which is another reason why I really don't think anyone, if they can avoid it, Will, will want to use these IDTAs. They'll, they, they'd, they'd much rather have all their data covered by one regime um, 
which, we, which I think is going to be the EU SCCs, partly because everyone's familiar with those and understands them. Um, so what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm currently suggesting that clients should be doing is, is trying to get the best of both worlds. In, put, put, if, if a client is now wanting to put um, some sort of safeguard in place, but doesn't want to wait to see what happens with the IDTAs, what I'm suggesting is that they sign a contract which first says that the old EU, SC, EU standard contractual clauses applies to UK data as the UK regulator requires, but goes on to say that as soon as the IDTA and the addendum come into force, that those are incorporated by reference automatically um, without the need to sign any further documents. And, 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 it, it, and that should work work, I think, to enable clients to get away with signing just one agreement to cover the period now and the cover and the period in future. And I know that's what another, a, a lot of other UK law firms are currently recommending. And, and you'll obviously, well, I'm obviously putting a sort of backup clause in the contract saying that for some, if for some reason, you know, the UK addendum isn't adopted, then um, the parties will cooperate to put whatever is adopted in place. Uh, and I think that should um, that that's the most practical solution to cover restricted transfers at the moment, uh, both for people who are wanting to put new EU SCCs in place, but also those who want to who who are having to replace their old EU SCCs with the new EU SCCs because the old EU SCCs will become invalid in Europe. Um, I think uh, uh, later this year, December this year, I think it is. Um, and the other, so that, I agree. That, that's that's what I was going to do to suggest or in relation to standard contractual clauses. I, I'll touch briefly on um, transfer impact assessments, although I know Linda's going to talk about those as well. So I won't go into too much detail, but I just thought I'd let you know what I think people are doing about transfer impact assessments at the moment or my clients and UK businesses. And the, and the answer is, and, and just, just to be clear, a transfer impact assessment is an assessment that the Schrems II judgment of the EU said needs to be carried out just to be sure that the, the laws of the importing country where the data is going um, outside the EU or the UK um, aren't, you know, won't undermine, the surveillance powers won't undermine the, 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 the um, effect of the, and, and the protection afforded by the SCCs. But my experience is, is that um, businesses are having, uh, to say the least, a lot of trouble with transfer impact assessments. Um, and most, uh, many of them, and I don't know whether Linda's going to agree with this, uh, are taking a view, uh, sort of risk assessment on whether to do a full TIA or whether to do a sort of light version on the basis that doing something is better than doing nothing. Uh, and this is obviously particularly the case for businesses with with transfers to all kinds of territories around the world where the paperwork involved is going to be massive uh, and the expense will be massive. Um, in practice, my experience is that they're looking at the high risk territories and doing a TIA there, at least first, and uh, doing a minimal assessment or a self-assessment even uh, for the others. Um, uh, and where for example, they are the reason for the restricted transfer is that they're using an overseas cloud service provider. Many of them, I think, are, are relying on the assurances of the cloud services provider as posted on their website that their security is fantastic and all that, um, rather than carrying out any independent assessment, which is what's strictly required. Um, uh, and I think some businesses are even, even finding that it's easier to pay to encrypt all their data than pay lawyers to carry out a transfer impact assessment. So, um, uh, and, I, and another thing that I think businesses are doing is, is using organizations such as Freedom House, um, which give countries a sort of risk score based on their, on their data protection uh, laws and performance. They're using that to help them assess which are the high priority countries where they need to do a full TIA and where they don't. Uh, and, I, and I think that many companies are going to continue doing this, doing a sort of transfer impact assessment, risk assessment, um, until the authorities start providing some practical help 
um, with TIs, such as shared, you know, country guidance or a white list of, you know, approved low risk transfers. Um, so that was all I was going to say about TIAs. Um, so, so um, Stella, back to you. Thank you, Kim. I absolutely agree. Fortunately, today we have two authorities here, and they are going also to, to probably to give us uh, more clarity about how to to deal with these impact assessments in in a really safe way, in order to give the security that companies need, not to transfer that. Uh, now, uh, thank you, Kim, again, and we are uh, Linda. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It is a pleasure to meet you virtually. I know that you are a passionate on these matters of privacy, and this is a really thing that we share that we have in common, and also that you like always to give uh, practical recommendations and try to uh, to find the best way to apply regulation in the more in the in the best practical way. So I would like to ask you, or I would like to know from you, from your experience, what are the challenges that you uh, see already? for the retail sector uh, regarding these international transfers and this, and this need to let data flow in from one country to another country. Linda. I saw. <laughs> I was muted. Thank you. Thank you, Stella, and thank you, Privacy Rules, for uh, inviting me to join this panel today. Um, I'm here today representing both the Swedish Trade Federation and Eurocommerce, which is our umbrella organization in, uh, in Brussels and representing um, all trade organizations and big companies in the, in the EU. Uh, I can only agree what, what Kim just said. Uh, I think two, the, the two main challenges that we see for, for our members as retailers and, and wholesalers are that the use of standardized services, which include um, third country transfers um, by default. And then we also have the, the question of how to do a transfer impact assessment in, in a, in a um, sufficient uh, way, let's say. Um, so um, what I wanted to talk about first is how, um, uh, what the challenge is in relation to the standardized services that are used, because I think we can all agree that the assessments that needs to be done right now, uh, they're fairly complicated even for us as privacy professionals. It, and as business organizations, we represent a large amount of SMEs. And if we think that the assessments are difficult, just imagine how small and medium-sized companies um, tackle the, these issues right now. They they might not have, or most of them don't have the competence in-house. Uh, a lot of them don't have the resources to uh, uh, to hire uh, lawyers, for instance, or, or take on um, external uh, advisors in relation to these questions because the budgetary room does just not exist. So they don't know how to do the transfer impact assessment. So they re rely a lot on uh, the standardized services and uh, the, the assessments that they have made. And just as Kim said, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I get kind of frustrated when, when uh, suppliers, when they say that, oh, but we are GD, GDPR compliant, it's fine. And you know, a salesperson, they can be very convincing. So for, for our members, um, they rely on what they, what they are saying and, may, and then maybe the contract reflects a completely other picture. So with that said, uh, as retail companies are dependent, dependent on standardized services and they often do not um, offer data localization by, by choice, but they choose completely unilaterally if uh, third country transfers should take place or not. Um, so, so here we can see that the GDPR of course lays down rules for both controllers and processors. Um, to make sure that such transfers are compliant with the GDPR, but it is all it is also often the it is also often the controller that has the responsibility to make sure that the transfer in the end is lawful. And we also see in supervisory actions that supervision is in relation to the controller and not the processor. Um, so basically. Um, the controllers and, i.e., the retailers are exposed to a much higher risk than 
than the processor. And at the same time, they also rely on their processors and or data exporters to, to actually make sure that the transfer is lawful. So given the use of standardized services, we, we have, I would say we have three main concerns. So one, one first concern, and we heard this in, in meetings with the EWB, for example, that it is as a customer, you have the power to make changes to a service. And, and I guess that's partly true that as a buyer, you can request that your supplier make changes. But at the same time, um, we are talking about standardized services. Um, it can be big tech companies, but it can also be smaller companies. And requests for those types of changes, they are associated often with high costs. And as I said before, they may, might not have the resources to start you know, tweaking about with the services. Uh, and they might not even know what to actually request from the supplier. Um, so that's one concern. The second concern is that um, I know some supervisory authorities have also mentioned that um, you can use like, indemnity clauses to help leveling out the responsibilities uh, in relation to the transfer. Um, and I, I guess that's true, but that only helps with the internal liability. So, so what's happening is you, you can you can of course turn to your supplier if you have an indemnity clause and and it results in some kind of damage but at the same time it doesn't really help strengthen individuals rights it doesn't really help um, to achieve compliance with the gdpr and you also have the you know the the goodwill factor and the brand factor to uh, to add to the equation here so um I, I just, uh, or we, we just don't think um, indemnity clauses is, uh, is the way to go to achieve compliance. And, and the third concern, and I guess this is the, the most important one as well, is that um, it's far from all suppliers that can actually provide um, the buyer with the proper documentation to be able to actually uh, conduct the transfer impact assessment. So as I said before, many of them might lack um, the possibility, but at the same time, if you ask, for instance, a supplier, I know some retailers they have heard that, okay, so we can't provide you with this information because it, we consider it to be confidential. And that's like, okay, so how are we going to proceed to make our TIAs? Um, and then um, even if they don't find the information confidential, they think that, okay, so maybe they cannot explain how uh, how everything is set up. They can explain what safety measures they have uh, they have implemented in the service, which could potentially work as, as a supplementary measure in relation to the, uh, to the transfer in order for it to take place. So, so it's just, it's, it's very difficult for them to receive the right information to be able to conduct the TIA. And then, um, I don't know, we, we just think that if, if you are a supplier of a service, you also have the control over the service. It's only reasonable that it is the supplier that, um, that actually uh, makes sure that you have the right information in order for uh, the controller to make the assessment in the end. So in, in our view, I guess it, it must be a, some kind of clearer balance between responsibilities and liabilities between both suppliers and, and buyers. And I guess, my point is that we, everyone, these are just very complicated issues. So we all must work together to be able to uh, make sure that transfers still can take place. Because as you said in, in the beginning, Stella, we, we live in a, in a global world now. It's not, it's not like we're just going to shut down and, and just work within the EU. Data transfers must happen. And, and uh, we in the retail sector, for instance, we, we see that a lot of com competitors, they, they are not existing within the EU anymore. We, we have competitors from China, from the US. So in order to stay competitive, you must be able to, to use the, the smorgasbord that, that, is, uh, 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 that is the suppliers right now. So I guess what, what we're trying to say is that the suppliers, they must also take responsibility responsibility. We do not want to say that uh, our members, they should not take any responsibility anymore and just like shove it down the line. It's just, we need to have a more balanced approach to it. And, and we do see a lot of suppliers that they create transparency reports. Um, 
and, and pro produce documentation that might actually help in these assessments. So we think that's very, very good, but it, more can be done. And I think also uh, that supervisory authorities have an extremely important role to play here that um, they can come up with like hands down, uh, hands on advice and proactive education maybe for, uh, for suppliers and other um, actors in this ecosystem, just to make sure that everyone knows what they can bring to the table in order to make sure that data transfer still can happen. And, um, and as business organizations, we have, uh, or EuroCommerce, they have a really good uh, collaboration with, uh, with the NRF, for example, and the NRF is trying to, um, 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 they're looking into investigating how the practical experience within the retail sector in the US is in regards to access requests from author authorities. So um, I think those types of initiatives initiatives could also help facilitating data transfers. And um, yeah, as Kim said before, like we, we need those types of standardized guidelines and standardized um, um, where we see that we can all help uh, just, you know, putting, finding pieces of the puzzle. Thank you, Linda. I think it is extremely important the point that you, that you came up because uh, as you said, we have these small businesses and these medium companies, medium-sized companies, and they don't have the same resources you know, in order to uh, implement uh, like a very sophisticated you know, measures in order to comply with. And I think also that it is not a matter just to comply formally. We need to comply effectively. And sometimes uh, these kind of companies go you know, or take this this route or this path in order to say, well, if I have to comply, I'm going to comply formally. But then you also mentioned that it is extremely important to supervise what is happening you know, during the uh, during the contract is uh, you no know, is it, it, when the parties are working just on this contract. It is not just at the beginning, but it is also during you no know, the time during this period of time in which this processor, for example, is uh, processing the information, the data, uh, the data uh, that is, I think, I I'm afraid that we have uh, lost Sophia for a second. I possibly suggest that she will continue with their comment on the on, on Linda's intervention. And in the meantime, Linda, no, uh, Stella, you are here. Okay, perfect. Back hey, to you. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. But perhaps you are broken. I suggest that actually we give the floor immediately to um, yes. Alexander. Um, and then we will continue with the no, floor I'm back. conversations I'm back. and comments. Okay, you're back. <laughs> Please. Sorry, sorry. It happens. It happens. So, okay. I just wanted to say that I couldn't agree more. And I think, Linda, thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. I, I completely agree. So now we are going, we are moving uh, to give, to, well, to talk with, Ale, um, with Alexander White, that is the Privacy Commissioner from Bermuda. And we are very pleased to have uh, with uh, to have you with us today. And I would like, because right now, to to highlight also that it is a, an, a great opportunity to have the both sides of the story. From one side, no, uh, we are seeing also the opinion of lawyers and also of uh, in the case of Linda, who represents this retail sector. And on the other side, we have the authority that always is also facing uh, challenges in order to uh, make easier to understand how to comply with this regulation. So Alexander, thank you again for being with us. And I would like to ask you um, if you can also explain to us what are the international regulatory trends uh, for, that, for data transfers that you see right now? Well, thank you very much, Stella Sophia, and, and thank you to our uh, previous speakers as well, who have done an excellent job laying out some of these issues. 
Uh, I, I wanted to offer a, a quick point of clarity since people may not be entirely familiar with Bermuda. Uh, we are a British overseas territory, uh, but laws such as the UK GDPR do not apply in Bermuda. Bermuda has its own parliament and its own legal framework. And so we have the Personal Information Protection Act, which is in many ways similar to the GDPR, uh, but provides a bit more flexibility in some ways. Uh, and, and so there's that dynamic to start out with. We're coming from a slightly different place. Uh, but that said, we are a, a relatively small country, uh, uh, relatively on our own in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, it's very difficult to have any kind of data interaction that is not an international transfer. Uh, every email communication ends up getting bounced off of a server in the UK or California or wherever else. And so it's very, very common to utilize the vendors that Linda was talking about in other countries. And so the, the, I, I'm very sympathetic to these concerns that, that have been raised. Uh, and, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of what our office is doing. And uh, like Stella Sophia asked, what, what some of the trends are. Uh, and, and so one of the uh, major trends that I'm seeing right now uh, is we're, we've got this fragmentation that's happening. Uh, and, and Kim did a great job talking about that uh, when he was talking about the, the UK setting up the IDTAs uh, as a separate mechanism from the standard contractual clauses. Uh, and, and we're also seeing more perhaps data localization requirements or other sorts of uh, you know, transfer restrictions. Uh, and, and so, and even more countries, even smaller countries like Bermuda are creating privacy laws that have a, a some kind of overseas data transfer uh, mechanism involved. And so there's a lot more to keep track of than there might have been otherwise. And, and that's a huge challenge for organizations to start out with. Uh, and, and so, I, I, like I said, I'm very sympathetic to that. I used to be a privacy officer myself, and so I've been in that position. Uh, and, and I see our role as the data protection authorities as trying to make this as simple as possible for organizations to, to meet these different standards. And, and so we've, we've taken two basic tacks with that uh, from our perspective. And the first is uh, that we don't want to say, uh, you know, you have to redo everything you just did uh, for a GDPR data transfer or a UK data transfer. You have to do that all over again, but do it on a pink piece of paper that says Bermuda at the top. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to have to, to make those kinds of regulations. And so we're working to recognize the guidance that's been in other jurisdictions, even if we only recognize it as persuasive guidance and say, well, we, it's, it's evidence of uh, good faith or evidence of due diligence or, or what have you. So trying to meet organizations uh, in, in that way. Uh, but also we recognize that there are a lot of potential, potentially useful mechanisms that uh, exist either between countries at the international agreement level or perhaps at the trade agreement level uh, and so looking at those as well and seeing how we can participate, how we can uh, influence those to try to encourage standardization uh, so that we're, we're developing a truly interlocked system that's going to make global uh, data exchange easier. And thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I have, I have one question. I would like to, to know um, what resources uh, do you provide or recommend to organizations or data protection officers? As you said, also that you know where you had this, this um, you were a data protection officer also before, looking to engage in data transfers. Yes, we, we've put out uh, several pieces of guidance uh, that could be useful. The first is a general description of uh, what to do when engaging in an overseas data transfer. And, and so, of course, this is in the Bermuda context, so we do cite Bermuda law uh, and uh, uh, go into some specifics in that way. But I think it would be very useful for all organizations because we talk about best practices. 
the, the, you, we cannot go through and say, here's exactly what you need to do in every situation uh, because it's just not feasible to do that. And, and so we talk about some of the, the, uh, the great things that every program should be doing just as a mature program. And, uh, and I believe that uh, my colleague Alejandro is going to get into some of those, so I'm not going to dig into that, uh, uh, but uh, we, we'll, we'll uh, have that, plant that seed for Alejandro to harvest later. Uh, and, and so I'll turn to some of the other guidance that we've talked about. But incidentally, it, it's funny, I think we need to do some kind of research project on the, the prominence of the name Alexander or Alejandro or Alessandro in the field of privacy. We do seem to have a, quite a, a common name for, for our field. Uh, but, but in any case, some other guidance that we've put out is, uh, uh, like I said, recognizing other mechanisms in other jurisdictions. So, uh, you know, we're an Atlantic country, uh, mid-Atlantic country, and so we're not, uh, for example, part of the uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperative, which has the cross-border privacy rules, the CBPRs, uh, that uh, countries can use to transfer data, or organizations can use to transfer data between countries. Uh, but that said, looking at that framework, it aligns nicely with our law. And I said, I didn't see a reason why we couldn't say, you know what, this, this matches what we're doing. There's no reason why we can't recognize that as a valid mechanism, as a useful mechanism for organizations so that they have that kind of framework that they can turn to and, and feel confident in uh, engaging in those practices. So that, those are the types of steps that our office is working on to, to help organizations feel confident and, uh, and, and you know, have some tangible real life examples and that can be very challenging because you know, we're, we're doing things uh, in front, in, you know, it, before, the, before the practices happen. You know, we're trying not to uh, wait until a mistake occurs and then, and then pouncing. You know, we're trying to, to provide proactive guidance out front. Uh, but there's also the risk uh, that we get it wrong uh, because, the, you know, the technology is changing. And uh, the, the risks and the threats out in the world are changing as well. Uh, and so we have to take in mind that just because we say something like this today, it doesn't mean that's going to be the case forever and ever. And you know, we have to recognize that this is going to be an evolving field that we may need to make updates throughout this process. But also we need to recognize the good faith efforts of organizations because they uh, can do their very best and still not get it perfect. And, and I don't think we should punish people for not being perfect uh, because that's a, that's a very high standard. Uh, and so we have to look at good faith efforts and due diligence and questions like that. Uh, and, and like, uh, like Kim said, uh, it, would it be reasonable to rely on the protection, or not, sorry, not Kim, it was Linda, uh, would it be reasonable to rely on the protections of that that this organization is claiming to have? You know, those kinds of questions I think are are much more more useful than well, should I conduct an audit on a, a cloud services provider just so that I can you know proceed with the contract? I like I like the last part that you also said that is um, about that you have to rely. For all of us, we have also to rely and to trust in good faith. But uh, many times, lawyers and companies, we are just trying to, to, to know which is going to be the best way to prove to the authority that we are really comply with. And that's not easy, you know? Uh, so I would like to know, how do you uh, see this, this, I think, this challenge for us? And what do you also recommend? Which kind of proof do you think that is going to be the, the simple one, the technical one, the, the mix of both? Yeah, I, I think we need to have a mix of both. And, and it depends on the, the situation that's involved uh, it, it, and the risk involved to the individual. You know, if we were talking about an international aid organization that was using the personal information of a, an asylum seeker, you know, that was being persecuted in a country, uh, and then they elected to transfer the data back to that country, knowing, uh, you know, that that person could be put at risk or, you know, something like that. that that's one thing. 
But if we're talking about another organization that's transferring, you know, perhaps pseudonymized data or, or something like that. So, you know, we have to look at the context of the situation and, and see what's appropriate uh, for those different situations. Uh, but also, every international transfer involves at least two jurisdictions. So, it, it, you know, to a certain extent, one jurisdiction can provide guidance. So our office could provide guidance and say, here's exactly what you need to uh, sh show it to our satisfaction. But you're always going to, an organization will always have to comply with at least one other set of guidance because they're transferring to some other country as well. So I, I think the real solution to this is for us and our government colleagues that work in trade and international affairs to develop mechanisms that can in be interoperable uh, across the world. And we are seeing that happen more and more. The Global Privacy Assembly, which is the uh, grouping of all of the data protection authorities around the world, just published a report from our uh, Mexico uh, a, a meeting uh, just a few months ago that talked about all the different trade mechanisms. It's a wonderful report if you want to see all the different uh, types of uh, treaties or mechanisms that are in place throughout the world. Uh, and, and so there are lots of options and we need to find ways that we can cross those bridges and, and make it so that, you know, perhaps we're leaping from, you know, this framework of countries to this framework of countries, but there is a mechanism that we can get from one to the other. Well, thank you very much. Now I am going to, well, we have our last speaker, and I said before, no less important, Alejandro Londoño. Uh, of course, I, I know Alejandro, and, and I can say also, hola, Alejandro, in Spanish. Alejandro, uh, <laughs> it is a pleasure to have you with us today. And I have two questions for you. I would like to start with the first one, that is, what has been the work of the Superintendency of Industry and Commerce in Colombia, that is our EPA, regarding the principle of accountability in this, no, in this framework that we are uh, talking today, that is uh, data transfers, international data transfers? First and foremost, thank you very much to Privacy Rules, Estela, uh, for the invitation, for having the Colombian DPA with us. And my colleagues, thank you for sharing the panel with us. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, accountability is a cornerstone of Colombian regulation regarding cross-border transfers. That's why, despite a controller sending information to a nation that the superintendents has considered it has an adequate level of data protection, it must also prove the DPA, Colombian DPA, that it has implemented appropriate and effective measures to warranty the adequate level of processing, but also grant security to the information it has exported. It is to note that what I'm, the recommendations that I'm going to proceed with are not just for the transfer controller controller, but also controller processor. That are two different contracts mechanisms that are regulation uh, established. So first, the as I mentioned, having accountability, the principle of accountability are, as a cornerstone of our regulation. The first recommendation that our guideline published in 2019 and updated this current year is to carry out privacy impact assessments before sending the data to another nation. This means an important system of identifying, measuring, controlling, and monitoring what it is happening in your organization. It is not just security-wise, but it also in human resources and uh, in all aspects. We as privacy practitioners have been knowing the principle of privacy by design and by default, and we consider it very important. But we have considered also important to incorporate, add to that principle two other factors. This is security by design and by default, and ethics by design and by default. That's why the superintendents has over the past uh, years have spoken about incorporating security, privacy, and ethics by default and by design in all the processes a controller has. 
This means, as we all know, that privacy is not just a mere formality. It's not just to produce documents, big contracts, big documents. If it is not going to be a, in practice, it is that great document you, you wrote won't be any effect. So privacy must be a cornerstone of what you're doing in an organization if it's data transfer. And with that said, you must add up security and ethics in your workflow. Also, you must be able to prove to yourself, to the data subject and to the DPA that you are authorized to transfer or transmit the personal data to another country. If you don't have proof of such consent, of such authorization, well, you, you should avoid doing that process. It is important, as you were uh, talking with our colleague Alexander Stella, for organizations to be able to prove that they have implemented such measures. It is not, it is not just implementing, but having processes, procedures, mechanisms to prove you have appropriate, effective, useful measures to implement accountability, to implement processes that will guarantee you a adequate level of data processing. If you have many measures being implemented and it is effective, it is very important to remember that it must at least be adequate and pertinent to guarantee the objectives established in our regulation. And this is guarantee the adequate processing of personal data being transferred and confer security to the records at the time of making said transfer. This is, you must always get, uh, have in mind these two objectives. If you are complying, if your measures are effective and useful, they must be effective and useful also and at least to warranty those objectives that our regulation establishes. It is also very important to have in consideration subsequent transfers of personal data. So it is in good faith and bearing in mind, as Alex, uh, Alexander mentioned, our colleague, it is at least you will be having two regulatory frameworks to be accomplished. But if there's going to be subsequent transfers, it is very important to have that into consideration and not using one legal framework to have just a, a safe zone then to bypass regulations. You must in good faith know where your, your uh, data is going. You must be transparent with the data subject to let him or her know where uh, the information is going. So that's why subsequent transfers are very important. Replicate proactive measures in the process of personal data. We have reiterated that education, human resources, and data privacy are hand in hand. If you don't have many resources to implement a, a very costful uh, measures, it's very important to at least work with your human resources team for them to know what is the rules on transferring data? Maybe it will be happening that in your organizations, the human resources, your call centers, uh, your team does not know that they are making an international transfer of data protection. So if they don't know they're doing an international transfer, well, maybe they won't comply your measures and your procedures the organizations have made. So it is very important to work with your human resources and be proactive in preventing um, some uh, breaches of the legislation. Articulate accountability in a, the tailor-made contracts. Uh, don't have contracts that you're going to use in every case scenario. Have in mind the tailors and the specifics of your case. For example, the nature of the information you're sending. Are you sending um, I don't know, sexual orientation, political affiliations of people, of your employees. Uh, what is the nature of the information? What is the, uh, are you having a big corporation or are you having a small corporation? It is not 
the same measures you will be having if your uh, the size of your cooperation of your of the controllers. So it is very important to have that in mind. And all of this, all of the measures, all of uh, the procedures you're going to take to grant those two objectives, what will be is that you will be having an in increase in trust and transparency with your customers and third party, uh, because that's a, a, a very important. And as you may know, confidence, trust in an organization is something that it takes time to build up. But confidence and trust can go up, go down and crumble in just a matter of seconds. So in order to improve trust and transparency uh, with your customers, with data subjects, it is also very important to have open channels of communications and disclosures of the use the information is being um, used, implement effective systems and that are timely response uh, to attend complaints. Uh, for example, if a data subject wants to know what, where his information is going, well, don't take 20 months to answer the question. It's very important to create trust and security also uh, to the data subjects. So effective measures to answer complaints and comply in practice with what it is said on the documents you have put in place. It is not just a formality. Privacy is not just a formality. It's a human right. It's a, for example, in our constitution, it's a, a constitutional right. So it's very important that what you are putting in your documents, it is not just a formal uh, checklist you're doing, but it's also that you're implementing it and you have a put in place um, the measures you have in mind. So, uh, so rounding up, those are the basic, at least recommendations that uh, we have put in place, apart and adding up as uh, pro tempore chairs of the Ibero-American Network, we have published with our colleagues a cloud computing guidelines that also take in part the recommendations of accountability and the principle uh, for transfers in this matter. It was it was uh, the last question that I I was thinking to to make to you that was uh, what are the new regulatory updates of Colombian data protection regulation? But you already said okay, but you can mention okay. I mentioned the guidelines of cloud computing with our partners in the Iberico American Network. We also have incorporated, uh, Colombia has incorporated also the principle of accountability in our sectorial law that it's credit bureaus. So that's another important matter. And as a matter of fact, we have initiated negotiations with the United Kingdom, with the EU, Argentina, and Uruguay for having Colombia as an adequate uh, level of protection nation. So we have been working with our colleagues abroad for getting uh, our process, uh, having a green light, and we have been proactive in, in that matter. But if you may uh, let me, much has been talked about data transfers, but we have considered also very important that in the world scenario, the collection of data from companies abroad via uh, mobile devices, via uh, computer systems, uh, cookies, uh, when there is not such uh, transparency and people and data subjects don't know very well their information is getting gathered and taken to other nations, is something we as data practitioners should also have been, uh, should be talking uh, because it's also a very important matter. Definitely, Alejandro, I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. We just have one minute less, and I and, and we have some questions that uh, our audience has just put in the chat. But I don't know, uh, Andrea. Now you are the <laughs> person in charge because I think we are, we are not going to have enough time to answer these questions. Uh, but I hope, and I'm sure, no, that our audience we live with important tips that we already just take from the a presentation of our speakers. Andrea, please. Uh, Stella, thank you very much. And thanks 
everyone and in particular thanks a lot to those in the public because we have we have received a lot of questions all of any of which actually is very interesting actually my proposal if you panelists have time is actually to go through the questions because eventually as i said in the outset you know we want to disseminate uh, independent expert information and uh, and for all those that have submitted questions i believe that they deserve an answer, um, and also those who will be viewing the recording of this uh, of this webinar, likewise, might find or identify themselves with the person asking uh, the specific information, and therefore the answer might be very beneficial to them. Um, as a general, as a general um, comment, if you allow me, very briefly, I think we have started from a situation of concern, legitimate concern, I would say. Both Kim and Linda represented two different words that communicate constantly because they represent industry trade companies and you know how these companies ask questions to them and their counseling in order to address a concrete a concrete problem which is the one that we perfectly know complex um, privacy regulations are getting more and more complex every day that passes but and, and and i like in particular when when linda said we all need to work together so i, I think linda if you if you allow as at privacy rules, we can adopt this as our motto because this is exactly what we are doing, and this is why we organize these webinars. But I think actually that you met, you you got heard, because both Alexander and and Alejandro um, somehow showed that proportionality um, and and you know uh, the fact that measures have to be adopted in given circumstances in a reasonable manner, on the basis of resources, starting with education, as Alejandro said just a minute ago, and, and, and caring about confidence and trust of users, somehow respond to your call for, for this collaboration. So thank you very much, because at the very beginning, I was fearing that this would be a way in which we would just scratch our heads and, and, and try to find possible answers, but we got reassurance from uh, uh, from Alexander and Alejandro, as I said. So um, I believe that you all agree on uh, taking some minutes more. So my suggestion is uh, some questions have been answered by, by Kim in particular already through, uh, through the chat, but the chat will not be published. So I would like to ask uh, Kim if you can uh, briefly, possibly go through the questions you received and you answered and answer again uh, so that this will be in the recording. And then afterwards, um, I or Stella can, can ask again the few uh, unanswered questions to, to all of you. So Kim, if you agree, we could start that way. Sure, yes, and sorry, I, sh I, I shouldn't have answered the questions. Um, but if you put a question in front of a lawyer, I have a, an impulse to answer it straight away. So that's what I did. Um, so the first the first question came from Sonal. Um, are there any data usage conditions or any transfer conditions by which I understood in, in the new IDTAs? And the, the, the answer is yes, there are restrictions on how the, the transferee, the importer, can use the data. They've got to minimize, you know, keep it minimized um comply with all the gdpr principles and so on uh, so they don't just apply to how you transfer the data they apply to how you use it once you've got it um, and by the way anybody else if they want to chip in please please do um, eduardo asked a question about um us service us-based service providers who, who simply post a data addendum or data privacy addendum within their terms of the agreement and but they don't require you to sort of accept it as a as a customer to accept it specifically um, is that sufficient and my answer was that as long as the data addendum is legally part of the contract with the customer and so is legally binding on them then that's fine so if posting the data addendum you know within the terms and conditions when the customer signs up makes it enforceable by the customer against the service provider under the applicable law in you in this case us law then that's fine and, and i agree with eduardo that that is a common way that it's uh, it's done by service providers um yes i'll leave the next one because linda answered that one i think um i'll just skip across to my next one which was um 
Mr. Anonymous or Ms. Anonymous asked, um, yes, SMEs are really struggling to comply with all the various data regulations, all the various different regulations. Um, even if there are, if they are small data flows everywhere, how, how can we comply with all these regulations at the same time? Is there a better approach working almost everywhere? And I think the answer is no, there isn't, but there should be. And if we all work together, there could be. Um, but um, the idea was that the GDPR would be the gold standard. And I think um, that if all countries sort of set their standards at the GDPR standard and companies complied wherever they were with something like the GDPR, then generally they'd be okay. Um, but, but it doesn't get around the problem that the GDPR standard is quite a high standard and in many ways difficult in practice for every SME everywhere to comply with. And then finally, for me, um, another, another anonymous <coughs> questioner asked, uh, if, you, if you're a multinational and you're transferring company uh, data to, to many company, companies in many jurisdictions, is there a template or a common practice or standardized articles which can be used? And the answer is um, that that, I think, is what binding corporate rules are intended for. Um, they allow, you know, you put in place one overarching agreement that applies to a multinational group uh, and legitimizes transfers to all the group companies. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good solution, but it takes its time, it takes time to put in place because, for example, it does require approval by supervisory authorities. Um, maybe I should pass back to Linda for um, her question. Yes, thank you, Kim. Um, so I got a question other than disclosure letters and clauses in contracts about data transfer. Is there any specific requirement for data transfers? And uh, I'm not, um, I think I understand the question, but I, I'm guessing just after Schrems 2, um, there are extensive requirements. Kim went through some of them in, in the beginning, but um, so, so if you are transferring data from, from the EU or from an EES country, then you need to, um, you need to make sure that the recipient country has uh, an adequate level of protection. So you need to ensure that the level of protection uh, when it comes to data privacy is essentially equivalent to that offered in the, in the EU. So that means that you need to uh, investigate um, how the um, how the legislation in the in the third country how it looks how um, how uh, national authorities could gain access to it and it's not only the legislation the legislation could look fine but you also according to edpb's new guidelines you also need to look at the actual practices um, so even as i said even if the legislation looks fine uh, they might not apply it like that in um, in real life so and if you find deficiencies in that legislation you need to either stop the transfer um or you need to uh, adopt supplementary measures so um that's just a brief summary and more requirements than that but yeah excellent thank you very much so if uh, if we can continue and i notice that actually Questions continue to arrive. Um, evidently, uh, the audience is taking the advantage of your expertise. Um, the first one that I have unanswered comes from, um, I believe, an Asian country. Unfortunately, I don't read the name. It's ideograms. Uh, the question is whether, with the exception of the European guideline, I believe the General Data Protection Regulation, is there any other data transfer framework, for instance, applicable in the APAC region or uh, any other jurisdiction or group of jurisdictions. Um, I don't know who wants to take up this these answer, possibly Alex, considering that very soon you will host all the data protection authorities in 2023. And uh, uh, of course, all, all of us are invited to go to Bermuda, possibly hosted by Alexander directly. Uh, so maybe you can answer the, this question. Yes, thank you for that plug. Uh, everyone mark your calendars for October 2023, uh, come to Bermuda for our Global Privacy Assembly. Uh, but that's a great transition because uh, I was going to mention the Global Privacy Assembly in answer to this question uh, as well. 
the report I, I discussed earlier uh, by one of the working groups of the GPA uh, went into great detail on the different mechanisms and quite often they are regional. Uh, so there is an African Union treaty, of course, the GDPR for the European region, but also the uh, Council of Europe Convention 108. Uh, and for the Asia Pacific region specifically, uh, there are, uh, I know that, the, uh, pardon me, I can't remember the acronym, but the Southeastern Asia uh, Trade Organization, I believe, has a, a, a mechanism, but also the uh, cross border privacy rules uh, is an excellent framework uh, that, that goes all the way around the Pacific Rim, so even includes North America and South America. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alex. And actually, the next question would be from Eduardo that was building on, on, on what you said earlier. Um, so given that 100% worldwide compliance is almost impossible, also on the basis of what all the panelists, I believe, agree on, uh, should authorities um, have some sort or adopt some sort of fixed standards indicating when companies will surely be fined and when possibly might not be fined. So I don't know the establishment of some sort of gray area where you might not behave fully in compliance with, but perhaps you might escape, escape fines. The, the observation is very valid because in, indeed Eduardo highlights that um, even within the EU, uh, uh, different data protection authorities uh, find in different ways uh, on the basis of violation of the same rules. So, um, so this is really a valid, uh, valid point. Yes, and not to get too philosophical, but in, in some ways this does depend on an organization's or a, and a regulatory entity's uh, regulatory philosophy and whether they choose to prioritize uh, you know, conducting investigations and looking at specific compliance or, uh, you know, deciding to engage more on the front end. Uh, there's a lot of different perfectly valid ways to approach uh, fining uh, and, and using economic incentives to try to change behavior. Uh, and, and so what I would say is that I think that there are many circumstances where it's, it's appropriate for international or multinational offices, regulatory offices to coordinate. And, uh, so, and so there are mechanisms in place for that, uh, the Global Privacy Enforcement Network and the uh, Global Privacy Assembly has an uh, international enforcement group so that uh, it, it not only can we coordinate and ensure that uh, we are, uh, approaching organizations about the same issues, uh, but also we can ensure that we're using our resources effectively, our, our being good stewards of our public resources. So I do think that there is an important role uh, for this sort of coordination that's being described. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't uh, simply say everyone has to do it you know, my way <laughs> because there are going to be a lot of uh, perfectly valid reasons why an organization might choose to find someone versus uh, to give them a corrective order, or what have you. So there, there are lots of potential uh, justifications for that. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, an elephant in the room that we couldn't host this time is actually cybersecurity expertise. Um, uh, generally, actually, we involve also uh, cybersecurity experts, so some of which are also member of privacy rules. Um, but um, there is a question that, in fact, relates to uh, technical cybersecurity tools or means that companies should adopt um, when processing personal data. So I suggest a, a possible question <clears throat> for a very little and short debate, perhaps between Linda, Stella, because Stella is also an expert and not only a great moderator, and maybe Alejandro in this case. Um, is there any indication on the technical cybersecurity standards that companies should use? Um, it, it, are there certain cybersecurity standards that are equal for everyone? Or otherwise, is it possible to have a balance between the, the means of a company? Um, meaning, I understand, you know, if a company is a very small enterprise, uh, possibly doesn't have an adequate resources to spend for very costly cybersecurity uh, solutions, whereas possibly bigger companies 
um, might definitely afford much elevated standards or more expensive um, tools. So I think in this case, uh, the fines of the ICO against the Marriott Hotel and British Airways are uh, uh, pivotal. So I don't know, Stella and Linda and Alejandro, I don't know if you want to contribute to these on the basis of your respective experience. Um, um, yeah, I, I can make one point. I don't have any specifics about uh, certain technical cybersecurity standards, but I know that a lot of our members, they've, um, they're asking for um, or, or not to introduce new standards. So for instance, when you look at Article 32 on what security measures to implement, they want to be able to rely on existing cybersecurity standards rather than um, inventing new ones that would align with the GDPR, they already think that, okay, so we have these sets of cybersecurity standards. Um, they should be sufficient when fulfilling our obligations under Article 32, for instance. So, uh, so that's one point I would like to make, just not try to invent something new, look at what already exists and see if we can apply that uh, under the GDPR. Perfect. Thank you, Linda. Still, on the basis of your experience, what do you advise to your clients? I think that my the first thing that I recommend is to identify the risks uh, before just to start to, to think what is going to be the best measure that I'm going to have or uh, that I'm going to get from my company is identifying the risks and work, you know, integrated with the area of security information and technology the area of, of, of technology and the area of data protection in order to combine this um, way of having a complete view of the needs of the company. And then, of course, we have in Colombia like a guideline because our DPA uh, has provided like a questionnaire on the safety measures that they recommend. At least it's not a recommend, but they, they are always are going to ask for it. So I, I suggest that you have to go through all these uh, questions that BPA has put in their platform and also try to uh, find the best provider in order to, to, to be safe. Can I just jump in again? I, ju I just thought of one, one thing that ties to what I said before, but I think this is a really good example because uh, technical cybersecurity standards or cybersecurity in general is often implemented in the services that you purchase. So if you are a supplier or if you intend to purchase a service, uh, I think you ask the supplier, ask the supplier, okay, so you have the service. This is not, we are not your only customer, hopefully. Uh, so you've probably done the assessment before. You know what type of data goes into the service. You know maybe how other customers have, uh, have assessed this type of service. Um, ask them to provide the information in order for you to be able to go on and, and carry on with your, with your business. Perfect. And Alejandro, would you have a comment? Yes, I would add to what Stella said. Yes, we have published a guideline regarding data breach. However, it is important to note the following. Colombia's regulation uh, comply, uh, obliges controllers to have security on their information. However, it does not imply a specific standard of security. That security standard depends on the information you have, the risk associated to the information you have, and the uh, nature of the information. So you, want, you have the obligation to prove you have a security standard depending on those factors and demonstrate, prove the DPA that those are the effective, useful, and timely measures regarding the information you have. So we as DPA uh, don't evaluate with the same uh, line, with the same bar, well, all the matters of security. It depends, as I mentioned, on the factors uh, because there's not, by legal terms, a specific security uh, standard. So it depends on those factors, the measures you should, as a company, implement um, to get the security of the information. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alejandro. 
Um, I believe it's time to close, but um, uh, if, uh, let's close possibly along the lines of one additional and last question from Eduardo, who was very active. Thank you, Eduardo, for being passionately an attendee to this event. Um, it, it, it's kind of a philosophical conclusion, if you want, of, of what we have been discussing so far. Uh, one of the two uh, combined questions from Eduardo is addressed predominantly to Alexander and Alejandro. It relates to um, your opinion or your interpretation of the trend. Are we still in, in, in the kind of world where companies have to be fined in order for them to understand that they need to care about privacy? Or to the contrary, the trend you can see in the few in, in, in what's happening next is that um, there is already an ongoing uh, process of understanding of the companies that they need to take or to do something in order to protect privacy of their customers, users, uh, clients. Uh, uh, I don't I don't expect you to tell that you are a tyrant and you prefer to issue fines and convince that way. But I mean, what's your take on this point? Well, uh, perhaps I'll start. Uh, and uh, I, I will say that perhaps uh, also because of our position uh, in a small jurisdiction as a new public office, a lot of what we are doing is teaching and helping people understand the risks and issues around uh, privacy. And so we, you know, I think that that has tremendous value to help people understand what can go wrong. Uh, and in many cases, uh, people fundamentally want to do the right thing uh, and want to protect their customers' data or their clients' data, and they just don't know how. And so it, it's a matter of instructing people. And in fact, we have a series on our, our website, um, privacy.bm is our website, uh, and, and we have a privacy means business a blog series. And so if you want to learn more about how privacy can in fact help an organization uh, promote their, their privacy programs uh, or promote their profitability even. Uh, there's a lot more there. Uh, but, but ultimately, I don't think we can argue that, that fine, for some people, the only thing that will change their behavior are, are fines and punishments. And, and for uh, getting the attention, uh, I, I don't think you can argue that the GDPR's uh, very high level of fines uh, has not been very successful in getting uh, high level attention, uh, data protection compliance. Uh, and so the question is whether, you know, we have to actually use the heavy end of the stick uh, is, is a, a valid question. But I think having that stick <laughs> to, to, to perhaps stretch this analogy too far uh, can be useful. Um, last month, we as a DPA have 10 years working in the matter. In those 10 years of all the complaints we have received, 53% of those have been dismissed. Dismissed because we as DPA have found that controllers indeed complied with our regulation. So the vast majority of the companies of controllers in our nation are complying with the law. From all of those complaints we have received in the 10 years, just a matter of 3% have been sanctions, fines. That's a very little percent. The rest of the data, and this is public available information, and we are very proud to say that companies are complying with the law. That's, that's good. That's the best for everyone. But the great majority of our work have been administrative orders. The superintendents of industry and commerce consider that giving administrative orders, giving direct instructions on how to comply, it is the best way, not just for the company, but for the data subject. If you find a company that does not, um, uh, won't assure you as a DPA that the company will comply with the, with your regulation. He, he, the company will just pay. And that it's not good for the data subject. But if you give administrative orders and make sure the instructions are clear for controllers to comply, well, the DPA wins, the controller wins, and the data subject wins. So as a matter of fact, 
uh, we have considered that as the best strategy. And let me finish with this. 10 years ago, when our DPA started, we received annually 2,000 claims, complaints from the people. Now, monthly, we are receiving 2,800 complaints. This means data subjects are empowering themselves of the rights they have. They are more conscious of their rights. And if they are more conscious of the rights they have, that will mean companies will also be in the need to comply with those rights they have. So educating also the data subjects, what are the rights they have, will help the DPAs and the controllers because it will create a data culture in all the systems. Alejandro, thank you very much. Inspiring, and I understand that when you were talking about education and training earlier, you really knew what you were talking about, and definitely you really believe in the value of that. Uh, okay, I would leave it uh, after hearing the, the authorities, our three other experts. Uh, one line tip, please, to your constituents, to your clients. Um, you know, th there is a tendency we hear from the authorities. What would you suggest in order to, to have a sufficient way of, 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 of complying, uh, responding to the provocation of, um, of Eduardo? Um, uh, I would start from, uh, from Linda. Um, so my advice, what's the question, my, what the advice would be yeah. um, to be able to comply? Um, such, such a big question and, and a difficult one uh, as well, but I would say um, just relating to what I, I said before, uh, take help from your suppliers, um, identify, as Stella said before, identify your risks at first. Um, and after that, you need, you need to prioritize, see what, where are the highest risks, start from there, and also take help from your suppliers, ask them if they've done the assessment before, what information do they have, because you won't be able to, uh, to complete this puzzle on, on your own. And, and also, um, I agree with Alejandro, education for your employees who work with this, because what we see also is that it's, it's so easy to enter into an agreement and expose yourself to higher risks. Um, just by clicking yes to an online service, which is like a, a plug into your website, for instance. So um, education and take help. Thank you, Linda. Stella. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, no, I, I, I agree. I think it's train your people, be transparent. I think that it is so important. Be uh, transparent all the time with your group of interest, with the authority, with everybody, and especially with the data subject, of course. And uh, make your best to comply effectively. Uh, it is not, I mean, it, the way is not to comply formally. The real purpose is to comply effectively. Excellent. As a true British gentleman, Kim, thank you for being forced to be the last, but definitely not the least. So the final word is yours. Thank you. Well, I think my, my sort of tip, my recommendation is one which uh, Linda's already mentioned in a way, and, and is an answer which is very important when you're talking about GDPR compliance, and that is prioritize. In other words, look at your um, key customers and vendors, uh, look at your highest risk territories, uh, and focus on them first, get them sorted out. Uh, and then, you know, don't wait, for example, for the new UK international data transfer agreements to come into force. Uh, get in, get, get, get going now, um, putting your, putting your uh, safeguards in place. Um, apart from anything else, uh, December 2022, when the, old, when the old EU standard contractual clauses um, expire you know will come along much much more quickly than you think uh, so get on with it now excellent thank you kim also for this uh, uh, enormous thanks to all to all our panelists really uh, this became actually a 90 minutes uh, webinar and not another 60 minutes webinar as we, we believe but this uh, is because we receive a lot of questions so i mean there was a lot of interest and i'm sure that all those receiving 
um, the uh, registration will appreciate and use the advice and tips that you have provided to them. So thank you very much for that. This concludes some way a three day um, tour around the world of privacy rules and many of our experts and interlocutors. Um, we started with um, privacy in mergers and acquisition transactions. Two days ago, yesterday, we discussed uh, about uh, the privacy in the gaming industry. Uh, and today, evidently, on international data transfers. Um, this also concludes our year of webinars. So from privacy rules, we wish um, serene, happy uh, season on holidays to all of you. And we will be again live um, in January, uh, hopefully with some of you, dear guests, uh, Linda, Alexander, and Alejandro included. Um, and of course, the recommendation to everyone, please stay safe. Uh, follow recommendations of authorities, not on privacy in this case, but against uh, the pandemic. And, uh, and hopefully 2022 will be not only the year of new European standard contractual clauses, but also a return to some sort of normality, whatever normality everyone you in the audience wishes for. So thanks a lot. And yes, Stella, please. Andrea, thank you. I would like to say a last thing that we are going to share in our uh, web page. Do you remember that we are going to put the practical tips that uh, came from this presentation in privacy rules. Absolutely, uh, thank you. Thank you. And also I forgot earlier to say that uh, Christian Leon um, could not be present today for an unexpected commitment. So on this panel was uh, one less, but evidently we would not have had time uh, for one more. So everything worked perfectly. Thank you very much again and um, uh, happy beginning of 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.